Hello there guys, what is going on? Son of Chelsea back here again for another edition of Let's Talk Chelsea. Hope you're doing well and keeping safe on this Monday. Another week starts in the transfer window, closer to the start of Chelsea's pre-season. And we've got some big news to speak about once again. Uh, not only recent transfer news, Raheem Sterling, uh, Jonathan Klaus who's been linked today. And I think there's been a lot of debate I've been involved with on Twitter over him. But also... Marina Granovskaya and Bruce Buck. Uh, Bruce Buck confirmed to be leaving Chelsea. Marina, we got a report from Matt Law that we're going to dive into over her departure um, this summer. So lots to speak about. Before we do get into it, I want you guys, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss any of the uploads on the channel. Also, do me a massive favor, if you are liking the content, to hit that like button because it helps new people find the channel but let's get into it straight away Matt Law's report here exclusive Marina Granovskaya set to leave Chelsea following Bruce Buck exit so in the morning um, this morning Chelsea announced that Bruce Buck would be stepping down as chairman but then we got this report that Marina is set to become the next big name exit at Chelsea after the club confirmed Buck had agreed to stand down Buck will give up his role which co-owner Todd Bowley is in line to fill at the end of this month and Telegraph Sport understands Granovskaya is in line to follow should her departure be confirmed before the transfer window closes as some sources believe is now likely to be the case Bowley will not only take on the chairmanship but also take over transfer negotiations which Granovskaya had been in charge of during the reign of previous owner Roman Abramovich so big news obviously there still is a little bit of debate over whether Granovskaya will be leaving Chelsea at the end of say this month like Buck is or it will be at the end of the transfer window in September. Um, that still needs to be confirmed. So there could be a situation where Granovskaya is still going to stick around, still going to be involved in transfer negotiations. But given this is now public news, it kind of feels a, a bit untenable. I may be proven wrong on that. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, the fact that people now know this and it's come so quickly after the Buck announcement, I think says a lot. We got sort of rumours last week about Granovskaya potentially leaving or at least there being an announcement over our future this week. So we'll see if Chelsea do announce something officially in the coming days. My opinions on it are, and I wrote a piece for Football London today. So if you want to hear sort of my written feelings on this situation, I think it's a positive because Bowley needs to... I think implement a new strategy at Chelsea, particularly in the transfer side of things, which obviously Marina has a massive hand in, has had a massive hand in negotiations over the past decade, over that with, with of course, working under Roman Abramovich. The connection to Abramovich, this is pretty much the last big connection to that era. So it very much is starting anew. Symbolically, I think it says something, but also I think instructive of where the club could be going over, say, a sporting director, a new transfer structure, Bowley keeps on referencing he did last week at a conference in Liverpool and their approach to transfers and given the way data and analysis is such a big part of American sport and the way they recruit players you think that Chelsea under Bowley who's going to have a very hands-on approach it seems like a very present approach at the club they will follow in a, in a similar way there has been concern that letting Buck and Granovsky are two big people in the previous regime go could be quite chaotic in what is still a big summer for Chelsea but eventually this is going to happen and I think we kind of knew it was going to happen uh, sooner rather than later it just kind of felt like that for months and months that Granovskaya's position was unstable would she still have a place in in the new regime I think the analysis of Granovskaya is is an interesting one because I think based on recent events and recent transfer windows and the way transfers have gone wrong, I think there's maybe a more negative perception of Granovskaya. Um, when actually I think when you broaden it out and look at her whole time at Chelsea, there are pros and cons. I don't think you can go one way or the other um, because you look back to some of maybe her earlier business, uh, the release clauses for say Diego Costa and N'Golo Kante, two deals under 40 million that were exceptional moves for Chelsea Football Club. Two players who transformed the team in their own way. Um, the sales of Avar Morata and Eden Hazard for big fees in different ways. You know, Morata recouping basically the fee we paid for him. Oscar for about 60 million. I think that Marina's brilliance in the early years was being able to get massive money for, for players Chelsea didn't want. I think as the years went on, and obviously I think the pandemic absolutely impacted the market that 
her ability to do that definitely dwindled, which is why you've seen a collection of unwanted players stick around for far too long, which is obviously sort of crammed up wages. The likes of Bakioko, Drinkwater, Zappacosta, Baba Rahman, um, Batshuayi, the list goes on of players o- over recent years. And I think the contract situation this year with defenders is was quite damning, I think, to the club. I don't think that... You can make all the caveats, you can throw in a lot of, say, what changed with those players, Rudiger, Christensen, how they improved on the circle very quickly. But the expiry date on both of those players' contracts were quite clear for some time. And I think it just kind of summarised, ironically, the short-termism kind of catching up with Chelsea under Abramovich, ironically, in his final year um, owning the club. So, Granovskaya, I think... Sometimes I think there's been a little bit too much blame because maybe people don't quite understand her role. Um, I think there still is maybe sections of people who think that she scouts the players herself. But she does have a massive hand in negotiations. And I think part of that uh, confusion over Chelsea's strategy is because I think at times it's been quite muddled. So it's been hard to sort of attribute who's responsible for what's going on at Chelsea. And you'd like to think under Bowley we're going to have a lot more of a clearer idea of, of how that structure works, at least in terms of who's in the position. Of course, all of these transfer deals, as they are at all the major clubs, are a conversation between many different people. But I think that sort of malaise, that the short-termism, the jumping from player to player and the confusion over targets and one target working for one coach and then not working for another, the sales of young players who could have benefited us in the long term. I think last summer, the, the instinctive nature to just take fees for young players without kind of understanding that, sure, you're getting, say, 20 million for someone who hasn't played Premier League football, but in a year's time, is that fee going to look a great move? And I think, obviously, I'm referencing Mark Gurhey here. It, it hasn't, and... I really hope Chelsea don't make the same mistake again. But, you know, the rebuild was not only, I think, in terms of when we took us been using the word rebuild, and I think we all have about Chelsea under Bowley. I don't think it's just about who's on the pitch. I think it's who's off the pitch and how that structure very much informs what what goes on for Chelsea on the pitch. So, Granov Sky leaving, she's obviously had such a great influence and the amount of contact she's had, the good work she's done. As I say, I think it'd be silly to say she's done nothing right but I think there have been clear major mistakes made at Chelsea for a number of years that I think need to be rectified and part of that is bringing new people in and, and you hope that Chelsea now under Bolly can can bring in the right people um, so as I say still need clarity over whether Marina is sticking around for the whole transfer window or whether she will be leaving pretty soon we'll wait to see on that front but let's get into some transfer news. So we spoke about Raheem Sterling yesterday. I'm not going to go in depth on Sterling again because if you want to hear my thoughts on that potential transfer, go and watch yesterday's video. I pretty much used the whole video to speak about Sterling, the pros and cons. But just for Brizzo Romano here, kind of about the potential fee and how close the deal is or what Chelsea have been doing. Romano was reporting last night that um, Chelsea's top target has reported uh, last Tuesday uh, was Sterling and Man City want around... 55 to 60 million uh, approach apparently for 25 million and add-ons turned down by Chelsea. Chelsea will be back with a new bid soon and as Man City are open to let him go, Man City apparently want 100 million to 110 million from both Gabriel Jesus and Sterling, of course, uh, Arsenal are chasing Jesus. And Ben Jacobs here, who as well has been reporting about Sterling today, Chelsea will now turn their attention to Sterling after the Lukaku exit is concluded, although Sterling is yet to decide on his future. Chelsea and City are also significantly apart on a fee. Sources close to the club admit they may settle for a similar fee to Gabriel Jesus that would put Sterling on the market for around 45 million with add-ons on top. I think just in terms of fee, I would be a little bit concerned if Chelsea are going upwards of 60 million for Sterling personally, because uh, then you think with wages on top of that, you know, is that really going to dent our ability to spend in other areas that are maybe more of a priority this summer? I think 45 million is still a good deal I think for Raheem Sterling given what he what he could offer to Chelsea um but as we know I think there's been a lot of a lot of um varied opinions about Sterling being linked to Chelsea so let me know yours in in the comments below and we'll see now with Lukaku all of that reaching its conclusion hopefully in the coming days you you're starting to see maybe a little bit more action or at least a lot more reports coming out about Chelsea and and the players we're actually interested in um which is quite interesting how that's very much tied into Lukaku and and his him going and Chelsea moving on and I think starting to get business done. Finally, another player who I have heard of before in terms of being linked to Chelsea this summer. I think a few weeks back, uh, a report came out of France about this guy, Jonathan Klaas, uh, who's a wing back. He does primarily play on the right, but he can play on the other side as well. Uh, for Lens, uh, French newspaper 
Lavor de Nord, I've probably got that wrong, have reported that the club are targeting Klaus to replace Marcus Alonso. The report claims that Chelsea have been monitoring his performances in Liga, while Lens are open to selling the, the 29-year-old if their 10 million euro, 8.5 million pounds valuation is met. Another player that I think is dividing opinion for a different reason, um, because of his age, for people who have watched him, he is a bit of a late bloomer in his career. And when you look at his stats, he is an impressive player. Someone who is playing at a, a decent level and maybe could have a bit of an instant impact. But again, you have to frame that in the context that he would be coming in basically as a rotational option. And as I say, that there is a bit of versatility to him. He isn't just stuck to one position, but he does predominantly play on the right. Um, and that area is quite interesting, I think, this summer because as, as I've talked about before, I think it's key if Tuchel continues to play with wing backs. It's key to have good profiles behind the first choice options in Ben Chua and Reese James. As we found out sadly last year, if you don't have the right profiles, our game deteriorates to a massive, to a massive low. I think into at times the rhythm of the game was really disrupted once Chilwell and James both got injured for periods of the season. But I guess the issue with Klaus is, and and it's it's a conversation we've had consistently about squad building. And how is it worth spending money on players who are backups when we could promote from within? And I look at the returning Dujon Sterling as a prime example who did play for Tuchel last preseason, apparently impressed him, has shown versatility for Blackpool this year, has played across the back line basically for, for Blackpool, um, really has shown um, I think consistency getting back on the pitch. I mean, Adam Newsom, my colleague at Football London, did a great interview of him because Dujon went on a few lo loans, but then had a serious illness, which, you know, really could have hurt his career. But he's responded well to it, got back on the pitch. And I think he's had a pretty decent loan at Blackpool. And again, a bit like what happened with Chalaba last year. Um, I don't see the harm in giving these common products a chance in preseason, a number of them to see if they can break through and really remain in the first team. I think the thing that people point out is with, with class is that look at the price, 8.5 million, considering other targets that Chelsea could be going after. It's not the biggest outlay on a player. Um, if he is a bit of a late bloomer and he can maybe go into his 30s a bit more than maybe what we would expect, is it the worst signing? I guess what you would say is what's the resale value on this player? Again, it's just in five, it's what I tweeted and people got annoyed with it. It's like in five years time, where is Klaus going to be? Where is Dujon Sterling going to be? And also, I think you have to factor in Tino Livramento. His buyback does get activated next year. And if Chelsea are interested in bringing him back to Stamford Bridge, there's always that to factor in as well. How legitimate that is, we don't know yet, but it could come into play next summer. So waiting a year, giving Dujon Sterling a chance to break in and others a chance to break in who are versatile, might not be the end of the world here. Um, and as I say, you're not paying for a first choice. But again, I, I, if I, you know, Klaus could come in and, and prove to be a really good experience back up to Rhys James, can show that versatility, can add the profile of player that we lacked greatly in, in large periods of last season. But my kind of instinct is I'm not, this is not a hill I want to die on. You know, it's just, I just think that Dujon Sterling, I'd like to see him given a chance. I'd like to see a lot of our youngsters coming back from loan given a chance because as was proven last year, I mean, Tuchel's best signing so far has been Trevor Chalabar. And it was a player that I don't think many of us expected to break through last year. And I just would like to see Tuchel give that player a chance, give several players a chance. And if we can, because you, we've got to be more shrewd in the transfer window. I think not only the major flops like we've seen with, with Lukaku and others, there's also this this problem that we spoke about with Marina with holding on to players for too long, them going out on loan, us not being able to sell them as they get into their later years. No one wants them because they've become surplus requirements at Chelsea and no one on the market wants to buy them, particularly with their wages. And, you know, if Klaus did maybe fall into that category and maybe you're only offered, say, Tuchel what he wanted, but then if you go beyond Tuchel and he suddenly doesn't offer what the next coach wants, that that structurally is a problem that Chelsea have to resolve in the coming years, that, that inconsistency and that feeling that you are buying players for one coach and they suddenly become irrelevant. I think Klaus, as again, people who have watched him, I'm not an expert on him, have said that he does offer a little bit more versatility, but I think it's an interesting also just like debate over what you want the future of Chelsea to be as well. I think it maybe says a lot 
um, over looking at the youth, looking at the, the carbon products and seeing them as not only a way to gain money, also a way to improve the first team and really bulk up the first team squad and give you those instant priceless options so then you don't have to go in, out in the market and spend more because the problem is Chelsea have so much work to do this summer and we're not going to be able to get all of it done, at least for me, to a, to a really good standard. And what you don't want is Chelsea spending money when, just for the sake of it on players who, who become irrelevant pretty quickly. Let me know your opinions on class. If, if you do watch him regularly and you do think this is, this would be a really shrewd signing, particularly under the, the fee of 10 million, which you know for Chelsea... Uh, sounds like a bit of a bargain, but that doesn't always mean you're getting a great player. There's sometimes a reason why that player is is worth that. But you know, Klaus has been, you know, he he's got now to the French national team at a late part in his career. He quite clearly is attracting interest from from a number of European clubs. So let me know your opinions on Klaus in the comments below. So thank you guys for watching this episode of Let's Talk Chelsea. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at Son of Chelsea, and I'll see you again very soon. All the best.